Now, uh, let's turn our attention to the weekend's football. I'm delighted to say David Myler is here with us. Uh, David, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good morning. How are we? Yeah, good. Um, uh, there's loads of different places that we could start and lots of uh, different stories to get stuck into. Um, I kind of want to start in a slightly unusual place and uh, Leicester hammering Sheffield United, um, primarily because of your tweet yesterday where you talked about the, the quality of Tielemans as a midfielder mm. and um, how ultimately you'd love to see him at Liverpool. What is it about him that has kind of clicked at this point in his career? Because he's still quite young uh, in his Leicester career and yet he's somebody who's nailed down a position as a first choice starter for Roberto Martinez at Belgium. We're finally beginning to see him kind of emerge from the shadows at Leicester over the last couple of weeks. No, I, do you know what, Ger? I wouldn't even say over the last few weeks. I think he's been one of them consistent players for them for the last, you know, few seasons. Um, if you think about it, he's only 23 years of, of age. Um, like he's played in the Champions League in the past, and of course, like you said, he's he's a regular in the uh, Belgian national squad. I just like the way he goes about his business. He's very tidy on the ball. Um, he's very creative. He's kind of that bright spark. And then I think Madison is the one who grabs the headlines. But you know, Yuri Tillmans is another one who like obviously looks to get you know Vardy going or in yesterday's case in Nacho you know they're trying to get them in behind and it's just the way he kind of keeps hold of the ball where he plays now of course whenever you put out a statement on Twitter or whatever people people hit me with the, oh he kind of blows up after 60 minutes but I disagree really I think he's um I think he's a wonderful talented player and like, like I said he's only 23 years of age he's only going to get better and better um and certainly I would love to see him play with, you know, one of the one of the big teams, like, you know, your Manchester Cities, your Liverpools, your United's, Chelsea's, who have all, who have a squad of unbelievable players. Leicester are fantastic, don't get me wrong. But, like, to go on to that next level, I'd love to see how he came, um, how he do there. Um, I definitely think he's, he's, he's a phenomenal player. It does seem that if you pair him alongside, say, Fabinho in a Liverpool midfield, you would get a similar thing to what you're getting alongside in Didi this season, which has been unbelievably effective for them. Yeah, but I think that's that's the kind of... The benefit for Telemans is I think a lot of people underestimate like Wilfred and Didi, how good he is. Um, he knows his role to a T in the sense that, like, you know, he just breaks up play, he's very calm, just keeps it ticking over and, he, like... He's he's actually a very good pass for the ball, so he kind of allows Tielemans to be able to get on the ball, get forward. You do see Tielemans a lot of the time like peel into areas wide to kind of you know, in order for them you know yes yesterday Leicester obviously played with the three at the back with the wing backs, but he gets them to push higher and he can get into pockets of space. But they have a great little partnership, and certainly when the two of them play and you have Madison, it is like it's a bright you know young midfield, and um, those three are very good players. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if any of them do kick on the next couple of years. We've seen the success, you know, say of N'Golo Kante at Leicester when they were successful to kind of go on to Chelsea and see the things he did there and obviously with France. So it will be interesting the next year or two if they do move on to invert to come as a bigger club. Who would he play with at Liverpool? Like, what would stick him in the Liverpool squad right now and, and pick that first choice midfield for me? Um, well, I think the big thing, look, is is there's always there's this talk over Wijnaldum. I know he's come out recently and said that, you know, he'd be devastated to leave Liverpool, of course. Um, he's been phenomenal servant for the last few years. Obviously, the success they had in the Champions League and the Premier League, he was pivotal to all that. I think he, the way I was kind of looking at it would be he would be his replacement. Um, now, the only thing is that energy that, you know, Genie does bring. But if you were to pick a Liverpool midfield three, for me, it would be Fabinho sitting as the whole midfielder. You'd have Henderson... And Tielemans, um, of course, then that's that's kind of if Wijnaldum moves on. Of course, then you've got Thiago, Curtis Jones. So it'll be a little bit of competition there. But that would be, I would love to see that midfield tried out anyway. Because um, I do think Tielemans is creative. He does have something. Um, like, of course, look, Thiago has that. Curtis Jones has that. There's been question marks over Jordan in that sense. Um, I still think he is capable of being creative. But certainly... It would be. I'm kind of. I was looking at in the way uh, if Genie was to move on, like that could be a good replacement. Of course, like I said, he's 23 years of age, you know, um, and he's a lot of experience. He's played a lot of you know big games, so uh, you know, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's interesting that uh, we kind of talk about who he could play alongside. Like, what does Tielemans do when you're James Madison playing in front of him? And 
how does that play into maybe a little bit of a resurgence in the number 10? Because I think we've seen a lot this season about how the number 10 position is dead. But James Madison is playing good football. Bruno Fernandes obviously is playing there. Odegaard has come into Arsenal and seems to have uh, picked up positions in, uh, akin to a number 10 as well over the last few weeks. I think this, the thing I like most about Madison is the arrogance and the kind of swagger he plays with. He's kind of like, he wants to be the main man. Every time you see him, he kind of wants to get in the half turn. He's looking to be the provider for Vardy. He wants the, you know, he wants to be the one that grabs the headlines. Of course, look when Jamie Vardy scoring the goals, but he wants to be the one, you know, that's playing the the, the Hollywood passes. Um, I don't think Tielemans is like that. I think he's just happy to go about his business. Um, he just wants to like. Anytime I've seen them play, he's always kind of a seven out of ten, and then you obviously you'll get a bit more here and there from him. But if he was to go on and kind of go to affect games more himself, that's when we could probably see him go on to another level. As you touched on, Bruno there is certainly that fella. You know, I don't think there's enough adjectives in the in the dictionary to describe his, you know, impact on United in the last, you know, what is it, 14 months. Um, he's just been incredible. Even like last night, you can just see when whenever something good comes for United, it always goes through Bruno. And I think like that's what Madison tries to do. And certainly if Tielemans was to probably take it on a level and try and be as creative as those, I think he could be. Leicester, this this next few weeks of Leicester's season is going to define whether or not they qualify for the Champions League next year. You have to assume if they qualify for the Champions League, they'll be able to keep most of their best players next year. Traditionally, they've kind of tried to cash in on one of the players and use that money to reinvest, and they've been absolutely brilliant at reinvesting that money. Is there a chance that they could actually keep all their players and then add players if they were to become a Champions League team next season? No, definitely. Um, I think it's kind of when you look from the outside, you know, you look at Brendan, you know, you've got a manager there who plays good, attractive football. Um, by all accounts, every day is enjoyable. Um, they all want to go in and play for that manager. It's then like, is the grass always greener? You know, if you if you leave and you move on, um, of course, you look at probably, if you look at the team say that were successful that won the Premier League, you had Maris, Kante moved on. Drinkwater was an example of someone who moved on who probably should have stayed. Um, of course, it probably be financially benefited him, but it didn't work out in the long run at Chelsea. Then you have Harry Maguire, who's gone on to you know have success and go on, you know, captain Manchester United. So there is a case that some of them could say, like, well, if we don't make Champions League football and there's a Champions League team, you know, wants me, do I move on? Um, and like you said, the reinvest money. I think certainly with the players they have, like Madison is young. I know he's been linked with Manchester United in the past. You've Harvey Barnes, um, you know, Vardy. I think he'll he'll play for another 10 years at Leicester. They seem to have this kind of core. And then, like, even if you look at the back line, they have a good mix of old and young with Forfana, Sayunchai, and then you have someone with the experience of Johnny Evans to help them. You know, they just have a nice balance in their squad overall. I don't think it would be too difficult for them to retain the players because I'd say it's, you know, it's like, look at them. They're up pushing, you know, the top four all last season. Of course, I know they fell away towards the end. But this season, they're back up there again. Um, so it, it, it just looks like a place as a feel good factor. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he kept hold of all of his players. But then, like you said, if he's looking at reinvesting, maybe bringing two or three players, does someone like Madison move on for probably the best part of 70 or 80 million? Then they look to reinvest that money. Um, I think we'll just have to wait to really see when the summer comes. They've got about 240 million from Drinkwater, Chilwell, Mares, and Maguire since uh, the end of 2018, that season. And I think they're, they're net positive in terms of uh, outgoings. They might have spent about 8 million, maybe, or it's 8 million either way over that time. Mm. It's an incredible, it, it's a, an incredible success story in terms of the hit rate that they have of signing new players who come and replace seemingly impossible to replace players. Oh, that, well, that's that's it, isn't it? That just shows you that the manager and, I don't know they say, the club secretary, the owners, they're all on the same wavelength. You know, obviously these conversations are happening behind closed doors and they're identifying the right types of players and they're signing them. You know, it's just, it just looks like a good inf infrastructure and they have a good balance that they're able to get this right. Of course, look, Chilwell was the, the name I forgot, um, even though I only interviewed him the other day. But like, he goes for 50 million and then you'd kind of say, is he better off at Chelsea than he would be at Leicester? But then, you know, that's that's the thing. Um, 
but at the same time, Leicester have just got it right. They just seem to identify these players. They pick them up and then, you know, Brendan does his magic and, you know, they go on and be successful for Leicester for two, three seasons and then a big club then comes looking at them. Yeah, James Justin signing from Luton Town. Not bad. I'm looking to see how much that actually uh, costs. But, like, I mean, you're selling Chilwell, getting Justin in from uh, a division below. Like, it's uh, a pretty incredible stuff from them. Just, can we talk about the North London derby yesterday, uh, yeah. David? Just to chat a little bit, first of all, here, maybe about Tottenham. Because Jose Mourinho can set up shop and defend against the best of them when it comes to any team in European football. And you can sometimes forgive him for that mentality. Can you forgive him for the way he set up yesterday against a team who are 10th in the Premier League? Uh, you see, on the way you say 10th in the Premier League, it's still Arsenal. You know, it's it's still, you know, your biggest rival. The game is going to be different. Um, like the way Arsenal probably played for the first 50 minutes hour, you know, you, you wouldn't have put them as a 10th team. Um, you know, the way they dominated possession, they were creating chances. Of course, look, Tottenham were always capable of catching him on the counter-attack. But I just, like, Mourinho fascinates me. Like, he comes out after and says, like, when we play the way we play, like, how can you, you know, we're not creative enough, we're not, how can you expect to win a game? Um, you know, he's coming up with stuff like that. But then, surely the message is coming from him to the players that, you know, we need to be solid, you know, be defensively solid, and then we can look to get forward at the right opportunities. Like, Tottenham were just, it was almost till Lamella got sent off then they kind of, when the shackles came off and they started to play and they started to create, and then, of course, look, Harry Kane had hit the post and it was a free kick, but they came at them. Um, Harry Kane also had the goal where he was offside from the free kick with the header. Um, it's just... They're just so... It's 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 almost a throwback to kind of like his Chelsea team where they were so good at getting in front and then they would be so solid and hard to break down. With Tottenham now we're going the other way where they're like hard to break down and then they're just looking to counter-attack. And eventually, eventually teams are going to get in. Somebody's going to make a mistake because we're all human. You know, it's it's very difficult to defend for large chunks of the game. And I just it frustrates me because uh Tottenham have some very good players. You know, they, they they have the ability to get on, you know, get on the ball and make something happen and you know, dominate teams possession wise. Um because then you, you see other games they play, like the Burnley, they come out. I know Burnley is not Arsenal, but they come out and they, they dictate the game to them. And I think yesterday they just left Arsenal to have too much control that, you know, by the time Lamella was gone, they kind of said, right, we need to try and get ourselves back into it. It's nearly too late because you've got the best part of 10 or 15 minutes to try and turn it around. And you don't have that much time. And, you know, Arsenal then are holding on. They're fighting to hold on to something. So it can be very difficult to, you know, break a team down like Tottenham. Or the yeah, Arsenal, sorry. I just find it interesting, just especially given Mourinho's comments pre-match, saying, I look up, I don't look down. If Arsenal was seven points ahead of us, I would look to them. But because we have seven points more than them, I don't look down. Like, if you're going to twist the knife and say Arsenal are, like, an inferior team to Tottenham, then you probably want to play like they're an inferior team to Tottenham. Yeah, no. They... <laughs> you just never know what Mourinho It's nearly like we've, we've, we know with him you know, from his time at Inter Milan to Real Madrid, there's always been the mind games. It was kind of like, yeah, he's trying to provoke the Arsenal players, but then it's backfired, hasn't it? Because now that gap has been cut to four points and now Tottenham will be looking over their shoulders at Arsenal because if it turns out that, that, that Arsenal end up catching them and go above them, you know, um, obviously Mourinho was going into that after winning his last two games. He was on to be the first Tottenham manager to obviously beat Arsenal in his first three games. Um, it'd be, I think it'd be disappointed this morning in the way they approach the game. I think they could have done that a lot better, certainly with the players that they have, the form Gareth Bale did, and of course, the partnership between Son and Kane. Like Harry Kane didn't touch the ball um, in Arsenal's box. Like that's just, you think of, that's just phenomenal, really. Player who's known for his goals or whatever, he's not getting the, the touches in and around the box and that. It's just, it's just scary. Mm. He made his mark on Gabriel, though. A uh, bit, bit of a late hit on him. Um, in terms of the big talk about before the game yesterday, David, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang not being in the starting team. If you're looking at that from an Arsenal perspective, how big a risk, even before a ball is kicked, is that to leave one of your best players out for being late? Is it actually good management? I think it is good management. Um, it takes a lot of balls to do that. You know, you like you said, you're going in... 
like Mick Arletta has lost his last two North London derbies. He was on to be the first ever Arsenal manager to lose his first three. And you think about it, your captain turns up late to a, to a team meeting. And it's obvious that, you know, Mikel has put in these fines or these punishments or whatever. And, you know, if your captain, what would the message be if he had, say, left him, left him in the starting 11? Um, I think it's, look, if you win your race, if you lose, you're wrong. He got it right yesterday. And even you could tell, like, he made substitutions through the game. And you're thinking, surely you're going to bring Aubameyang on at some stage. But he he chose not to bring him on. Um, I think it just kind of sets the tone that he was like, look, guys, I'm in charge. I don't care if you're my captain or if you're a young boy, break, you know, who's broken into the first team. Um, if you're late, you're late. I, I, I fully respect it. You know, obviously, timekeeping in football is massive. Um, certainly you don't want to be late for team meetings. You don't want to be when you're, you know, the bus is leaving the hotel or whatever, whatever it may be. You, you just don't be late and fair play to him because obviously he said like, if you were late, this is a possibility. And I believe it's not the first time Aubameyang has been late. So I think it's been an ongoing issue with them. Um, and then of course, there's the reports that once um, after the game had finished, there was players, you know, doing a warm down session outside. So obviously the ones who don't play enough minutes will do runs or whatever. Um, Aubameyang didn't do them. He drove away. Um, so that would be another concern. But look, Arteta will be clever enough. He's been around the block. You know, he's dealt with big players from, you know, his playing days. And of course, being at Manchester City with Pep, he'll be well used to you know, dealing with these kinds of players. So like, I imagine... Like he'll he be did dressed with Mesut Ozil? Mm. 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 I, uh, I think... <laughs> oh... I don't think it'll go to that extreme. It shouldn't. Um, it'll be a wake-up call for Aubameyang, though. You know, in the sense that, like, yes, you are a captain, but you can't just have the free reign of turning up late, doing what you want. Um, it would be a gentle reminder to him. And you think about it, Arteta, Arteta made him captain. So you're kind of going against everything you've done. But I think, no, look, Aubameyang would have had the night to sleep on it. Um, he'll probably go in this morning and you know he'll address it and just say, "Look, I'm sorry. I imagine he'll be fined, however much it is. We pay the fine, and then they'll crack on as normal." The um, speculation around the Celtic job is starting to focus on Roy Keane. Story in the back of the Sun yesterday that um, he's expressed an interest in it. Um, what do you think is right for Celtic at this point? And and is Keane should he be in the mix for that gig? A hundred percent. I think so. Yeah. Um, of course. Look. Anyone who listens to me now will say, like, look, he's been out of management. Is it the best part of 10 years? Um, so this kind of saying, like, oh, the old, <laughs> the old uh, barstool fans or barstool managers, I should call them, uh, will say, look, he's not, in the, he's out of touch with the modern game. But definitely Celtic have had a very disappointing year. You know, you think of obviously you've won nine in a row, you're on for 10, it's great. And, you know, they, they believe they own hype. And then, you know, obviously, Rangers were incredible um, the season they've had. But I think if Roy was to go in there, he brings that winning mentality. You know, if you look at, you know, the impact he had at Sunderland, say, because Celtic will be low, they'll be flat. Um, like, Rangers have blown them out of the wall this year, which is unheard of. I definitely, I'd love to see Roy take over Celtic. Um I think I think he would turn them around next season and I think they would be challenging and I think they'd beat Rangers. So Roy, Roy's the man to get them back to the top then. You're, you're, you're backing him to get the job done, not, not only to take over, but to get him back to the top. Oh, 100%. Yeah. There's... How big a... Oh, sorry, go on. Like, obviously, the thing is, Roy has a certain mentality of of... You know, he's so used to winning and he has that drive. And that is Celtic. Celtic is, I think it's a good fit in the sense that Celtic are used to winning. They don't like losing to Rangers. It's not like, you know, in the Premier League where if you look over the last 10 years, you've had like Liverpool, Leicester, Manchester City. Of course, Manchester City have probably dominated. I think this is their fifth league title in the best part of 10 years. Um, so like, okay, they've had that, that great success. But in the sense of Celtic, Celtic are used to winning all the time whether it be, look, you look at Brendan doing the trebles, you look at Neil Lennon doing a treble, I think Roy has that winning mentality. He has that hunger. Um, and I think if he was to take over, he would, you know, 
it would quickly iron out a few problems that have you know carried on or dragged out through this season. Um, and I definitely would expect them to win the you know the Scottish League title next season. What sort of problem is Roy Keane good at fixing, David? Because on the outside looking in, it seems that if a team is lacking in motivation, that if they have the quality but perhaps don't have the attitude, he might be able to fix that. Is that is that a correct perception, or is he actually better tactically than we all give him credit for? He's better tactically than you give him credit for. Um, there's always look. There's always this thing that kind of all the ones all people say they're dinosaurs. They don't know what they're doing. Blah blah blah. But most managers played the game. They understand it. They've gone through the eras where things have changed. Um, you look at Roy Hodgson. He's still, of course, look. He's stuck with his four four two, but he's adapted and changed for you know God knows how many times. There's no doubt that Roy could go in. And he'd give certainly he'd give the place a lift. Um, of course, look, it's been Celtic fans, you know, would be frustrated seeing all the, you know, the range of celebrations, the way they've carried on and the reminder that it's their 50 fifth league title. Um, I definitely think he'd go in and he'd be, you know, he is tactically aware. Um, he knows the game inside out, watches luxury. We see him every weekend on Sky Sports, you know. Um, he'd bring, it's almost he'd bring that hard work, that drive, the success back to players. And, I, you know, I, I know he's itching to get back into management. I definitely think it's a good fit all around for both parties. Um, it's just whether or not it, you know, it, it happens. One last thing for you. Uh, Shane on WhatsApp says, Jer, can you ask David if he reckons Harry Kane gets away with more from referees and pundits in the UK? Not the first time this season that he pulled that trick and could have seriously injured Gabriel. He's never called out for it. No, he's not. I, he does get away with stuff, 100%. But then... You don't you don't associate Harry Kane with being a nasty player, do you? There's only those little clippets of you know when a ball is played long and he's backing into defenders and they go flying over him. That's very dangerous. Um, of course, then he'll fight his case saying, "Well, I'm trying to be strong and take the ball down." Certainly, like yesterday, the one on Gabriel is that's naughty. You know, um, of course he's going to get away with things. He's England captain, isn't he? Well, that was the question. Sorry, I mean, yeah, uh, he, of course he does. Yeah, but he's not. But it's not as if. How often do we see Harry Kane do something outrageous like that Gabriel, you know, shoulder barge kind of forearm barge yesterday? We don't, it's not, it's not part of Harry's game. That was pure frustration for him in the sense of the way that, you know, Arsenal were dictating the play to him. He wasn't, he wasn't involved in the game. You got to think like that would have hurt him. He would have been, he would have been angry inside. So he's left a bit on someone, but he definitely, you know, I don't think it's it's purposely like that a referee is going out saying like, oh, Harry Kane is playing today, I'm going to leave and get away with things. But the England, think, the England captain does get away with stuff. I mean, uh, younger viewers may be unfamiliar with um, Alan Shearer and, and Neil Lennon, where Neil Lennon has his head kicked in, essentially, and Alan Shearer effectively gets away with it. This is just before the 1998 uh, World Cup. So there's a long tradition of the England captain essentially having, you know, free reign. Oh, yeah, he'll get the rub of the green on certain decisions, yeah. Of course he will. You know, that's just... I want to keep everyone on site, don't they? Of course. <laughs> he's, he's the English Diego Costa is all I'm hearing. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Diego was unique, you know? I think Diego would fight with the mirror. <laughs> David, good stuff. I don't stuff. think Harry Kane's like Diego. All right. Good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. David Moyer giving us some thoughts about the uh, weekend's football. It was a good question as well about uh, Harry Kane coming in on WhatsApp. 0879 180 180 is the number if you want to get in touch with us this morning. It's 842.